Hello everyone and welcome to Edusol's Clinics. This is the third part of our series on hernia anatomy and its applied aspects. We already saw the anterior and posterior anatomy concepts. We saw the European Hernia Society nomenclature or classification of the ventral hernia. And we saw some important surface landmarks and orientation about the inguinal canal and femoral canal in the previous parts. Along the journey, we are also looking at important name structures and we are moving towards the Furtado classification. So in today's video, we will discuss more on the open anatomy of inguinal hernia. And this is something that we have already discussed in our ventral hernia mesh placement video, the abdominal wall anatomy and the muscular layers as well as the sheath or the aponeurosis layers are very important when it comes to inguinal hernia anatomy. So if you have missed out on this video, do have a look at the mesh placement video of the ventral hernia where we have discussed the abdominal wall anatomy. We already discussed the ligaments in the area, the inguinal ligament, the cooper ligament and the lacunal ligament as you can see here on the left side of your screen. The Hazelbach's triangle, the inferior epigastric artery and the surface orientation of the inguinal canal and the femoral canal. Now when we talk about the inguinal canal to the very basic aspects, it's a 4 cm long oblique canal which is parallel and superior to the medial half of the inguinal ligament. As we already discussed, the deep inguinal ring surface landmark is the midpoint of the inguinal ligament. So it is fairly easy to understand that the inguinal canal will be over the medial half of inguinal ligament. The extent as we all know is from deep inguinal ring to superficial inguinal ring. So when we start from the deep inguinal ring and that is deep or posterior, we can understand that the posterior wall of the inguinal canal is what it will pierce. So the structures enter the inguinal canal through the deep inguinal ring, which is at the midpoint of inguinal ligament and it pierces the posterior wall of the inguinal ligament. So inguinal ligaments like a cuboid okay, or a cylinder. So it has anterior wall, posterior wall, floor, roof and the, all these structures are routinely asked in the exam. So you have to understand the different walls of the inguinal canal in order to understand the surgeries that we perform on inguinal hernia. So as you can see here, the posterior wall is formed by transversalis fascia laterally and the conjoint tendon medially and the anterior wall is formed by the external oblique aponeurosis in its entire length and internal oblique aponeurosis laterally. The superficial ring is an opening in the external oblique aponeurosis. So if you see a two-dimensional image, it's not very simple to understand the inguinal canal. But if you understand this box kind of concept, you will understand that the deep ring is an opening in the posterior wall and superficial ring is an opening in the anterior wall. The floor is formed by the intern edge of the inguinal ligament and lacunal ligament medially. We have already seen the floor structures in the previous video, right? And the roof is formed by the arch fibers of internal oblique and transversus abdominis. So, all these structures are very simple to remember if you understand the abdominal wall anatomy. So see the video on abdominal wall anatomy if you are not clear in the concepts there. Because the structures are simply the abdominal wall layers that are ending at different levels in the groin region and giving rise to the inguinal canal. So external oblique aponeurosis, then roof which is internal oblique and transversus abdominis. And behind transversus abdominis is the fascia transversalis, which then leads to peritoneum. So anterior to posterior, very easy to remember. And the floor is formed by internal part of inguinal ligament and lacunal ligament medially. If you need a mnemonic to remember this, in counterclockwise direction, it is the muscle, then aponeurosis, anteriorly ligament, which is inferiorly or the floor. So superior is muscle or roof is muscle, anterior is aponeurosis, floor is ligament and posterior is tendon and transversalis. So that is a mnemonic mold.
Now coming to deep inguinal ring, it is an inverted U-shape structure through fascia transversalis and it is lateral to inferior epigastric artery as we have already seen. Its surface landmark is 1.25 centimeters above the midpoint of inguinal ligament. And again, just to highlight the fact, mid-inguinal point is different from midpoint of inguinal ligament. Base is formed by iliopubic tract. As we will see in the posterior anatomy, the posterior reflection of inguinal ligament is the iliopubic tract. So the base of deep inguinal ring is formed by iliopubic tract and the sides are basically thickenings of transversalis fascia. Coming to the superficial inguinal ring, it's a triangular opening through the external oblique aponeurosis. It is 1 cm above and lateral to pubic tubercle. So the base is formed by the pubic tubercles and the site superomedial is formed by external oblique aponeurosis and inferolateral is formed by inguinal ligament. So that is regarding the superficial inguinal ring. Some important contents, spermatic cord in men and round ligament in women and ileoinguinal now blood vessels and lymphatic vessels in both. Commonly asked question is the content and coverings of the spermatic cord. Remember that there are three coverings. The term three is very important when it comes to spermatic cord. So external spermatic fascia, cremastric fascia and internal spermatic fascia. Again, if you remember the abdominal wall anatomy from anterior to posterior, the external oblique aponeurosis forms the external spermatic fascia. Fascia transversalis forms the internal spermatic fascia. And the internal oblique and transversal abdominis aponeurosis forms the cremastric fascia. Coming to the contents of spermatic cord, it has the vast deference and the remnant of processus vaginalis, lymphatics, three important veins. One is the pampiniform plexus testicular veins, the cremastric veins and the vast deference veins. It has again same artery to vas, testicular artery and cremastric artery. And nose that is genital branch of genitofemoral nerve and sympathetic plexus around the artery to vas. So when these contents are discussed, the term three is important. So if you can see three veins, three arteries, if you include the ileoinguinal nerve, then three nose and three covering. So that is the easy way to remember this anatomy. Very commonly asked question and very important conceptual area to understand if you want to do surgeries in this area. So with that we come to an end of the open inguinal anatomy as well as all the important concepts that you need in order to understand the Furtado classification which is I feel the best way to understand the groin anatomy and if you understand the Furtado classification laparoscopic hernia surgeries become very easy. So we will discuss that in the next part. This is our website www.learnwithadusults.in where we have some important content. You can see all our past videos here. The channel has been going on since last three years now. Recommended books where we have shared recommendations for various branches and some of the books of our faculties are also there. So you can have a look. Thank you.